you see the first of a pattern here of letting nothing getting in way of some kind of a geopolitical objective. Once they decided they wanted to take Gaddafi down, there was nothing anybody could do to stop them. To the law, which had not uh, uh, signed up for uh, regime change. Even 1973 was simply a no-fly zone uh, with a bunch of conditions attached to trying to establish peace and including many commissions that were supposed to have been brought into place, but the UN never even bothered to activate uh, because there was uh, no serious interest on NATO's part not to in exact regime change, uh, which, uh, you know, you can think what you want about, but I think as clear as light of day, it was illegal. And also, uh, we transferred boots on the ground in, which was against the UN in 1973, where there was probably 10,000 special forces there from the different countries. Countries took turns bombing it every night with different systems. Norway, one night, Britain, another night. This is all to test NATO concerted action. Uh, they were uh, disgustingly uh, stroking their own egos on their marvelous coordination with a uh, 200 to 1 outnumberment of the uh, Libyan people. The Libyan army casually popped off the Libyan navy one night in harbor at Tripoli, sunk as it stood gave themselves medals for having done the offshore bombardment. So the reason I don't think Dr. Musa Ibrahim is lying is because the number of atrocities that have happened in Libya could make a hundred page long book just of bulleted headlines. So every day an officer from the former army is killed, uh, uh, treasures are looted, ancient communities are terrorized, ISIS is beheading, people are fleeing, money's getting stolen. Um, so uh, that's the situation. Last election, 15% turnout. Um, you know, uh, the D bat, all the mistakes of uh, Iraq repeated. Uh, uh, one of them was debatification in Iraq by expelling everyone that created the basis of ISIS because part of ISIS's logistics is, is from Ba'athist officers that were all fired by our governor there. Uh, under Bush, that awful, dreadful man whose name eludes me, Brenner or something like that, Bremer, um, the proconsul of uh, our territory. So he sees a failure for Hillary to learn the lessons from Iraq uh, in Libya, which is in Iraq we see that one election or two elections may not be worth the price of the terrible devastation. The, the entire intellectual history of the country was burned to the ground at their library of manuscripts. It is unbelievable. It's impossible for Americans to even conceive of the loss of history when the uh, library burned, was burned and looted. And the uh, people there had begged the Americans for help and support. The Americans refused to do it. They bombed the country, then refused to protect its antiquities. Thing of a hundred mistakes we made in Iraq botching the mission. Up. The question about judgment is uh, the first question about judgment is. Uh, why would you think that uh, collaborating with known jihadists who are now cooperative jihadists uh, could end in a, a good situation? Uh, so there's this guy, Bill Hodge, who's a poster child of why we should think twice about what we did in Libya, because he was the supreme military commander of Tripoli, which is their capital for a while, their biggest area. And he's a former, uh, basically, Al-Qaeda associate. Uh, who is supposedly now reformed, and he sued Britain. Uh, it's quite a remarkable story. I think it's Abdul Hakim El Belhaj. You see, there's this uh, first impulse to set up this snare for to take down Gaddafi, let's say even under uh, some sort of idealistic uh, premise. Uh, but the first question of judgment is uh, how she can view uh, this as success as it's followed all the same mistakes of Iraq. Uh, American smart power at its best. So America critically provided intelligence uh, and unique capabilities that might have made it much more difficult for the Europeans to take out Gaddafi when they took him out, because uh, a big part of it is that uh, the Libyans had literally nowhere to hide with the American drone and surveillance and telecommunications sweeping capabilities along with their CIA and special forces on the ground. It made a huge difference, yet Gaddafi held out for eight months. See, 
if we are to believe Lucy Ibrahim, and as I said, there's a hundred crimes that occur in Libya, so I don't see why in particular he'd make this one up. I don't see the motive. There's already enough awful things we know about what happened. Um, because what appears that you, what you have is a fairly urbane, sophisticated ruling clique in Libya that are not of the sort of barbarism to conduct mass purges at this point. There's no evidence of mass purges in Libya. There have been targeted purges of a couple of hundred people, uh, but uh, uh, these were not the type of people that engage in that crude level of repression, as far as we can tell. So we know if you go, to, I know it, people don't like the Washington Times because it was a uh, connection to Moon, but they had, did have a very excellent series on uh, the internal informants and leakers from within the government, within the Department of Defense, saying that they had not signed up for this, they weren't interested in overthrowing Gaddafi. Uh, Gaddafi had voluntarily uh, given up his weapons of mass destruction in a sort of armistice with the West in 2003. He had cooperated in the war on terror. Uh, and um, anyway, I just really can't fathom how the United Nations Security Council could have thought this was a legitimate use of a no-fly zone to bomb out the entire Libyan military with this guy under his father, Rob Smithson, saying we will continue operation until no civilian can be harmed and utterly obliterating all the, the security structures in Libya, allowing a small core of about three to 4,000 jihadists uh, multiply the numbers through intertribal rivalries and power uh, rivalries uh, with uh, uh, 10,000 Qatari troops on the ground, according to Qatar, uh, who are extremely militantly anti-Gaddafi, uh, sort of stormtroopers, as well as foreign fighters streaming in through this Libya, uh, Turkey, Syria nexus between the Islamic State lands of uh, Syria and the uh, Al-Qaeda al-Nusra regions of Syria to uh, Libya with the arms export as well as via Qatar, Qatar to Turkey and on the arms trade in the Saudi, I don't know if they transshipped via Turkey. So then what you've got is you've got, uh, in my view, fundamentally, that this no-fly zone is uh, criminally used to create a war that destabilizes the country. Clinton holds up an election, but an election is not worth the complete destruction of a country with the spread of Islamic State over it uh, and the uh, destruction of its antiquities, of its uh, riches, uh, with a third of the population in flight, the masses of number of people tortured, abused, killed, etc. Um, that uh, is not worth the price. It wasn't necessary because the Libyans were urbane people. They wouldn't play ball with the West under terms such as internationally monitored elections. Three, it's a fixture goal on regime change. She made her deal and she was getting bad information, as we know, through this email scandal from this idiot, Sidney Blumenthal. See, I started sort of thinking this was a good, legitimate uh, uh, revolt in Libya myself. But uh, within a month, I found that Libya had these precious things about it that need to be preserved and not be bombed. Uh, that was my main concern. All could be worked out through dialogue, yet. And the Defense Department seems to have shared my view. Yet state pushed hawkishly. Apparently state was more hawkish than the National Security Council itself from credible reports. We see this extreme hawkishness. And then we see what appears to be a violation of international law with the use of regime change, which leads, I contest, to irrefutable evidence that what happened in Libya is not at all worth the, the uh, supposed benefit of a parliamentary election uh, when the country no longer exists. Uh, so at any rate, uh, then she proposes the same thing in Syria. She proposes to use a no-fly zone brazenly after having committed these horrible crimes and destroyed a country, not having learned about what had happened in Iraq previously. So then the next aspect of analyzing this hawkish streak in Clinton, because if you really want to get at the root philosophy of it, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, here is an Atlantic article on Hillary Clinton's foreign policy. Um, and uh, the words used here, using contested intelligence, a powerful advisor urges a president to wage a war of choice against a dictator, makes a bellicose joke when he's killed, declares operation success, fails to plan for power vacuum, and watches Islamists gain power. That describes Cheney in the 
Iraq War and the Clinton and the War in Libya. And they're following the same recipe for Syria. Right? There's Islamists all over the place in these areas. We're fueling the regional weapons. Okay, what I was saying is that we have also transferred vast amounts of weaponry to uh, the Middle Eastern countries that support these Islamic extremists. Uh, these extremists are a rainbow of groups uh, from uh, uh, groups in the Free Syrian Army who are break away from the army itself, which didn't really happen precisely in Libya, although whole um, uh, the generals broke off as NATO began bombing. Um, so in a sense, there's a parallel there. Um, then they had, group, uh, but the primary group over there um, is the uh, Army of Conquest and the principal army in it is Al, an Al-Qaeda offshoot called Al-Nusra. And um, so we're funneled 120 billion in weapons, roughly. Um, I will reserve Clinton and Ukraine for another time, but I'm pretty sure if you study her and her constellation of Susan Rice, Samantha Powers, views on the Ukraine, you're going to see the same issue with an extreme tendency to gloss over rightist tendencies in our allies uh, in a uh, domestic power struggle uh, and to leverage minority groups into positions of control if they are willing to ally with us. So it's a tremendous competitiveness. Uh, by Clinton. She wants to win in global geopolitics as the American player. Um, come hell or high water, uh, regardless of the consequences, she probably believes that the eventual submission of these company countries to our companies is in their own best interest in the long term. Sort of like being adapted to the Borg or joining the invasion of the body snatchers. She also did not oppose a military coup in Honduras, the most violent country in the Americas, which puzzled all freedom-loving people. Um, we have to sort of say what's wrong with this uh, uh, hardball geopolitical player playing for America position and worldview. And you can read the Atlantic article to get more depth about this, and I'll put it in the footnote. I mean, Russia's military budget's around 100 billion a year or less. So we are we transferred Saudi Arabia and Qatar as much uh, arms as Russia's entire military budget per year. Give you an idea of uh, the size of the recent transfers to people that cousins are funding Al Qaeda, their uh, nephews are funding and joining ISIS, and other members of their family aren't. Uh, has a master's degree in economics uh, from uh, Oxford and uh, is a good capitalist and likes to play golf on the weekends in Scotland. Your view is in two parts. And so the first question is what really matters? And uh, the key concern to me as a Californian today is climate change. Uh, I think we have to stop all fossil fuel now because it's just getting too gnarly out here. Um, you know, I would be happy to just take horses and not have my snow all go away. Uh, I mean, it's getting very severe. We lost 95% of our salmon. The crabs are poisoned from being too warm. Lowest snowpack in 500 years. Most of the valley water table drained. Seems like it's very important. Then the other issue is war, which ironically... Defense Department is the biggest user of fossil fuels in the world. War. This is a very important issue. Uh, so we want to have a candidate who's going to uh, work globally to reduce arms and to retool arms industry into civilian productions with subsidies to give them a fucking, excuse my language, golden parachute into domestic conversion industries like mass transit. Imagine an ultra-efficient high-speed light rail system that could handle cargo as well as individuals, but as well as individual light cargo, allow your kid to go to school in another area if he was not happy with the local school and in a, a 
paradise, uh, we would be focused on things like that. So um, war is a big issue. The conversion of all that activity into a useful activity and the horrors of the entire system around war of shock and rebuilding and looting and embezzling. Uh, then the other issue, which uh, according to my own step-grandfather, who was a Federal Reserve uh, 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 economist, uh, he was concerned about concentration of wealth as the number one threat to American economy. And, you know, uh, small government people say that there's equality of opportunity, not equality of condition. But do we have equal opportunity at all uh, today with this increasing tilt? Because uh, for capitalism to work in an ideal system, the worker has to have some bargaining power. And if we have automation and things like that, the bargaining power of workers is going to keep shrinking into uh, specific hot op 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 occupations at any given time. But uh, increasing uh, lack of opportunity for people on the edges uh, in this system where they're losing their bargaining power through the oligarchy and the insertion of the individual. They have no bargaining power increasingly. Another challenge is how do we use modern communications and power systems of the world to transform politics so that people do have control of their government, so that agencies do not become captive? How do we, the people, stay engaged in our government? Uh, and in this case, I really want to say that Bernie Sanders has addressed extremely well. That he's, uh, and the key question, as Noam Chomsky has said, is how do we take the Bernie Sanders movement and de-Bernie Sanderize it and turn it into a national movement. So we need to feel the burn without it being about Bernie. Now I hate to skip to my conclusions in all of this, uh, but I believe we have the technology now to revolutionize how we do politics, and I believe that we have a need to reach across country lines to find communities that are common globally and stitch all these different pieces of a new solution together. Uh, so you've got people like uh, Gar Alperovitz, who wants a, a new economic system, uh, people interested in direct democracy, people interested in new kinds of banking. There's all kinds of new thinking out there. There needs to be a way to integrate all of these uh, into uh, centers of uh, change. Um, and then there's a tearing between change that's voluntary, which could be libertarian, as in Ron Paul, it could be bioregional, though. And that's where uh, my own interest in Jeffersonian democracy uh, lay. And that's uh, another thing I want to bring up later, is to compare Bernie Sanders to Jeffersonian democracy, because I've had a lot of arguments, I've had a lot of arguments with Republicans about this issue. Um, Um, so, I, you know, if you look at Bernie Sanders' overall uh, positions, he position, he, he's in favor of uh, the power of the worker uh, and uh, increasing his bargaining power through things like unions. Uh, he's also interested in um, of universal health care. So I, I don't see universal health care as being problematic for Jeffersonian democracy. Um, and if it's the only thing you're trading off, I don't think you can shut out the Sanders campaign. So um, the other issue is uh, higher education. Higher education certainly would have been in the scope of the founders thinking in a modern technical world. I think Sanders is absolutely right. If all the other countries have it, we should have it. So this leads to uh, where does Bernie Sanders' political philosophy uh, come in, in the, his world? part, I showed you uh, his voting record, uh, which is 75 to 100 percent with Peace Institute. So let's see if I can find it for you again briefly, just so we can review. I also showed the uh, voting record. So here you have him with an 89 percent uh, vote uh, in Peace, and I generally uh, support all these positions. You know, the U.S. is far too warlike. We shouldn't have gotten involved in any of these wars. All of this could have been solved through negotiation, in my opinion. The worst peace is better than the best war, according to many. He had a 75% score here um, in the 2014. So I unfortunately don't have this for Clinton uh, precisely. 
but if you uh, go through her voting record, uh, you know, one of the obvious things is she wasn't present at a lot of votes. Now, finally, um, I think I have the conclusion for what is the worldview philosophy uh, behind Clinton. Um, and that'll be the next thing.